Hello, and welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast. Today, my guest is TJ Martinell. He is an author, writer, podcaster, and reporter, frequently seen roaming the Cascade Mountains in the Pacific Northwest. He has written six fiction books and extensive articles about gun rights for the 10th Amendment Center, a constitutional think tank. A variety of essays and short story, stories of Martinell's have been featured at Terror House Magazine and Punch Riot Magazine. You can find out more about him and his diverse work, including the Mountain Pass podcast by visiting tjmartinell.com. Welcome, TJ. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yes, thank you. So I was interviewed by you a few weeks ago, I think now, and uh, we got to know each other a little bit there, which is cool because before that we just knew each other on social media. So I'm going to dive right in and we'll try to figure out if we can see what makes you tick. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the interesting things is that you are a, would you call yourself a mainstream print journalist? I've, I've definitely worked as a mainstream print journalist. I've moved more towards a bit of a niche journalism okay. market where I write for I'm currently the only writer for the news site that I work for. It's the lens.news and it covers Washington state uh, public policy from kind of a, a business perspective. But okay. I definitely worked in the, the traditional. I actually worked for uh, MSN News back when it was still alive. Uh, I was wow. there for a month. So that was, that was probably the closest I got to going into mainstream. But having been there, seen it, I, I'm glad I it didn't last. How uh, long my, was my that? It was a month and it was, it kind of really gave me an idea of how they do journalism at like the 30,000 foot altitude, mm -hmm. which is very much not really concerned about what the ramifications are of a story. You just publish the story and then move on. Yes. And so there's a much more quick paced and not necessarily hung up on <laughs> the details. So uh, it's, it's been, it was definitely interesting. I didn't really like the way it was going. Yes, and but reason it, it I, didn't last anyways yeah. compared to so other reasons. There's a little bit of a delay. Oh, just if I speak over you, I apologize. Yeah. Keep going. All right, it's all right. I, what happened is you had people who are not reporters trying to run a newsroom, and mm -hmm. I think as you've worked in journalism, don't have you know it's like don't have your bean counter run your advertising or your marketing. Right. You know, keep everyone in their their place their respective places and that's not what happened there. Okay. Yeah. So I worked in the mainstream print journalism world for, I don't know, 15 ish years or so. So I think that's interesting that uh, one of the newspapers I worked for would have called themselves kind of alternative journalism because they were kind of at the forefront of this whole civic journalism thing, but it was still a daily city newspaper. Uh, so you're, you're kind of a dissident author by night, not, quite mainstream print journalist during the day. So how did this all occur? Uh, when did you start writing novels, uh, stuff for the 10th Amendment Center, that kind of thing? I'd say I, I'd always been writing a little bit of fiction. I always had a bit of an imagination when I was a kid, but it was also, I just copied a lot of what I'd seen in entertainment and stuff like that. So some of my earliest short stories were just me repackaging the books that I had read. So uh, when I was, we were talking 10 or 11 or 12 or something like that. But then I got into college and I was consuming a lot of TV shows and a lot of uh, stuff that, entertainment that I was getting really frustrated with the the politics that were involved. So the, I felt like there was nobody really conveying my, my political views or my, the kind of men that I wanted to see. And so I was reading a lot of books on that stuff that had been written, the kind of like where eagles dare guns and Navarone, that kind of these old old traditional stories so i decided to start writing my own and at first it was just a hobby but then i started to read a lot more books i started to develop my writing and actually take it more and more seriously and i spent a lot people always say well tj you know not everyone is a natural writer i'm like you're right i wasn't either i was an awful writer i have some of my earliest work still and my writing was pretty bad uh, I understood this, the idea of story structure, but what was really driving is just a desire to see the kind of stories that I wanted to read uh, out there. And so I actually, one of my big things is I need to be able to enjoy reading my own books in, in retrospect, where I just pick it up occasionally. And 
uh, I remember that Alexander Dumas was writing so much, he hardly ever read his own work. And so there was this one famous anecdote where he actually picked up one of, I think it was the Three Musketeers of the Count of Monte Cristo. And he seemed like genuinely surprised at how much he enjoyed it because he just never read any of his work. But that's not really how I am. I, I want to enjoy my own books. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of what I think dr- should drive a lot of writers, especially ones who are not really doing it. Either, I want to say doing it for the money, but they're not making enough money to have it be even a side gig. It's more of a hobby right. and, and a passion in that sense. That's where I really started to do writing. I actually started journalism when I was in high school. I was uh, religiously reading the newspaper just because I was fascinated with, you know, I grew up in the Seattle area and obviously the politics have never been anywhere near what, what I believe, but I was always interested in getting other people's perspectives, reading about their opinions, understanding why people think differently than me. I was reading a lot of their, this, the Seattle Times columnists and stuff like that. And so I think I had an idea of how to write in a way that was understandable when I started writing my high school newspaper and I understood the concept of the inverted pyramid. So that carried with me when I went to college and I was actually going to go into video production because I was really passionate about that. But for various reasons, I decided to go into journalism and I, it's been kind of a love, love-hate relationship because a part of me wishes I had gone into a field that wasn't going through so much mass upheaval. I mean, for people who are not in the industry, really, I'd say the Great Recession was the big killer for a lot of newspapers, but also just the internet uh, has revenue since the time of the internet has just caused newspapers revenue to drop. And so they can't pay people. Yes. Uh, and so that I think that that's partly the reason for the quality of journalism today is you can't, when I was starting out in journalism at a, a local newspaper, this was back in 2011, I was getting paid $12 an hour. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and, and, you know, in that area, I don't know what other parts of the country is, but that's, that's like, you can go work at a, a, a footwear department and make mm-hmm. about as much money. So that yes. was kind of, I wish somebody had told me that before I got the degree. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so I got the old J degree too. And, you know, I, I often think, what if I had, you know, not married my husband, you know, this different path. And if I had stayed in journalism, you know, even if you're an editor of a department, you're not making that much money unless you're working for a premier, you know, the New York Times or something. It's right. not the highest paying thing. So I find it fascinating that, you know, I love the fact that there's so much competition in writing now and getting stories out. Yes, there's a lot of bad writing out there, but, you know, I think it does hold these traditional, whatever, dinosaur media writers, their, their feet to the fire, and they need that because, uh, you know, there are great people out right. there who don't have journalism degrees, but we're a couple of the two that do, so there we go. <laughs> I'm right. glad you're still, you know, uh, earning a living from that, both, you know, by day and by night. So before we get into some of the things you're doing by night, uh, what do your colleagues think about your work? Do, do they know anything about what you do on the side? Um, are they interested in it? I actually, <laughs> we're a pretty, uh, pretty small operation. I'm the, as I said, I'm the only writer. We used to have a couple more, but they moved on to, you know, moved to different parts of the country, moved on to other types of jobs. So I really don't, I'm as close, to, I, I tell people I've, I'm as close to a self run self-owning businessman as I can get without having to do any paperwork. I have a very autonomous kind of job. And so I think they're, they, they're perhaps aware, but I just don't really, I guess, I don't talk about it too much as part of my job because we don't, it's, it's so strange. You know, you, I hear horror stories from my friends who work in a corporate environment where they spend so many hours wasted in meetings. And it's like, Mm -hmm. My bot, my supervisor and I have meetings where we get strict. We we t- chat with each other on the phone. We get right to the point. We don't sit there and like talk about random stuff because we're we're busy doing we're busy doing our jobs. <laughs> so right. I uh, no, I end up not really talking about that kind of stuff because it's just not germane. But right. I mean, I, th- I I've always thought about that because I think part of it is I I've, I've flown under the radar, not necessarily with with people that I work with, but I'd say. When you're a journalist, you eventually develop a fo- either a following or people are aware of who you are in your work. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'd say my my politics are, I try not to flaunt it too much and it's becoming increasingly difficult because, you know, being, being reality-based is now political ideology. But at the same time, I'm clearly kind of outside the norm for a reporter, if, I'd say in, at least in Western Washington, but probably right. most of Washington State. 
Well, that leads to my next question. You know, we who don't live out there in the Wild West, you know, we're, I'm wondering, is it really as wild as we think? Is, is it as woke as we imagine or are there enclaves of sanity? It's, <clears throat> I've actually been thinking a lot about this. The Pacific Northwest is really still a frontier pioneer state in a philosophical sense, but not in a tech, not the way we imagine technology in, in a lot of ways it's changed. But what it means is it never, unlike say Texas or New England, Vermont, and uh, these other parts of the, in the, obviously the southern states, it never really got a chance to form its own identity before people really started moving in in mass. We've always been kind of, for years we were always just that state up up in the uh, Northwest, but people really didn't pay too much attention to us because just nothing was going on of note other than Boeing. But what that's also led to that I've known, I describe it as, at least for most of the state, it is a secular Puritanism that in the in the stereotypical sense of what we would think of Puritanism, you know, this very kind of authoritarian, totalitarian ideological view and where, you know, if you're not one of, if you're not a part of the group, you get cast out. Right. And if you're not part of the ideology, but also uh, this very much policing of people's opinions, thoughts, not a lot of privacy, unless you're a person who's within the prevailing view in which you get to have privacy. So uh, that's, I think, what throws people off is they describe the Pacific Northwest as being the least religious. And I would say actually the opposite. It's one of the most devoutly religious. They just don't call their beliefs uh, a religion. They call right. it something else. They call it. Uh, climate change, for example, uh, they call it wokeism or w whatever long list of, of, you know, polytheistic gods that they serve. <laughs> but it's polytheism with a stamp of like uh, secular Puritanism, if, yeah. if that makes sense. Yes, uh, and, but then there's also parts of the state that, yeah, there, there's also different parts of the state where it is mm -hmm. kind of a frontier area. There's there's literally areas that are described as uh, not autonomous zones. They're in the kind of the rural area but they're uh essentially a state and and states of anarchy and what i mean by that is there there is no law enforcement and so the people there pretty much enforce their own how, how they do things and i'm not saying that anything illegal is going on there but they they there's no uh public services there's no nothing they're ranchers they're farmers and things like that there's nobody around for a hundred miles or something something along that line so there is a bit of a frontier thing mm -hmm. what's really interesting about the pacific northwest is that you can go from living in being in the city to being in an alp mountain like scene in about 45 50 minutes so there's an area called snow Valley pass it's very beautiful i live out uh, outside of a bavarian tourist town called leavenworth that has alp like mountains everywhere that's only two hours away so we have are very geographically diverse. You can be in different places, but that also means there's very different lifestyles. If you're living in Seattle, it's very different than living in um, rural parts of the state, even though that's changing because of so much development. Our state's been exploding in the last 10 years. Right. So how would you describe yourself if somebody held your feet to the fire? Paleocon, traditionalist, just conservative Christian, heritage American, I see your shirt. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes it's easy yeah, to just yeah. label yourself <laughs> because you just got to sometimes. W how would you do that for yourself? Um, my answer would, pr I, I, not to give too long of an answer to a, you know, I know I'm supposed to be speaking generally here, but it really depends on the audience. If I'm talking to somebody whose politics are more similar to mine, I can be, I, I just have to use a word that they're gonna understand. Because if you use, for example, um, nationalist, People have very different ideas of what a nationalist looks like. You have people who think nationalism in, in a cultural and social sense, and you think of people in a political sense. I'd say at this point, I'm I, socially and culturally, I'm a nationalist, it, but I'm also, it's such a weird thing because my I'm very big into my heritage and my background, and it goes through different parts of American history. So I honestly don't know what I would say. If somebody were to ask me, like, if a person on the left would ask me what I am, I would say I'm, a, I'm an American nationalist. And they would say, what does that mean? I believe that the United States government ha needs to serve the interests of the American people before foreign company, or before foreign companies and foreign countries, yeah. but also <laughs> um, foreign interests. And that at least gives them a context of like what I'm, what my interests are. But if I was talking to somebody who's more similar to my views, I'd be a little bit more specific and say, uh, probably, 
a paleo conservative or something like that because that's a word that doesn't really trigger people emotionally it makes them intellectually curious that's another problem that we have to deal with now is these words that they immediately will just get hung up on as opposed to being intrigued and saying, well what is that i've never heard about that before um it's the same reason i don't call myself an, i you know i used to be very strong into libertarianism and, but i would never call myself an anarchist because most people would be thinking of a seattle anarchist who's trying to grow a garden out of cardboard boxes in the middle of, you know, <laughs> Capitol Hill or stuff like that, right. rather than somebody who thinks that people should pretty much govern themselves. Right. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit of what your heritage is, uh, a little bit about your ancestry? Yeah, so I descend on my mother's, mother's side. Both sides are primarily Anglo, but one side descends all the way from the, uh, the pilgrim. So 1630s, he was this famous architect, Thomas Joy. He uh, designed, I think, their first town hall or something like that. And then I've got uh, fellows or sisters on my, on my dad's side of the family that came across on the Oregon Trail. We actually have furniture from that they brought over from these, the east part of this, the country. Why they brought a rocking chair out of everything, I don't know, but that's what they brought. They brought a rocking chair in their, their little wagon. Uh, my, wow. my, but also I have a local kind of heritage, and this is what makes it very interesting for me, at least, is that my ancestors were some of the earliest European settlers to the, the, the it's called the Squawk Valley, but it's basically this place called Issaquah, which most people who've never heard of it will not be able to pronounce correctly. We have a lot of Indian names, uh, and I grew up in that area, so a lot of ties to that part of the state, and then also I got a lot of ties to the country, so that's why it's difficult for me to describe kind of what, what I am politically, because my loyalty is to my, you know, where my heart is, is in the country, but there's parts of the country I've never been to before. So, right. and that also raises the big issue of like where I call home. Do I call Washington State home? Yeah. Is the New England area where I feel at home or, or is it, you know, somewhere else? Um, and as far as language, I also have Irish ancestors um, as well. The, uh, my my uh, grandpa was partly Irish and, and Prussian. So, uh, but what's interesting about lineage and heritage is that it's not so much like people tend to think of like what's the predominant it's more of like who won the culture coin toss because um a lot in a lot of cases it was the wives families that ended up bringing their anglo protestantism into a family that was not uh at least protestant but they just weren't uh, for example my surname is originally italian but they the italian men continually over the years because we have photos of them they all married anglo women so it starts out with this very, very Italian looking man uh, with his, with his uh, you know, English wife. And then a hundred years later, his very, very white looking uh, uh, great, great grandson uh, with his English or American wife or whatever. But that, that's kind of the interesting thing is I also have Italian uh, lineage from the Benito region. We, we, we know where he originally came from, but uh, we really don't have a lot of Italian culture by family. I right. <laughs> I think most people would agree. Um, uh, you, you had mentioned libertarianism and nationalism. Would you ever consider secession? Cause that's a big thing, not just in, you know, libertarian circles, but in a lot of people's circles these days, right. if that happened, would that square well with how you define your nationalism? I mean, my hope is that there is some form of, I don't know, I don't know what it would look like. And it's always impossible to decide how how things play out. But my hope is that at one point there's at least some sort of massive decentralization of the United States politically in a, in a way that would resemble secession. I don't know if it's ever going to occur like the USSR, but my hope is that the issue with me and where I live is that our state's kind of split in half. Mm -hmm. And so if that, if let's say our region were to leave, well, our, re, our part of the state wouldn't want to remain with the other part of the state. Right. So that could cause a lot of volatility. And I think that that's one of the issues with our country today is it's not really an East Coast, West Coast, South versus North. It's the uh, the urban areas versus the rural. And I would I think a part of the, the advantage or the opportunity for me would be, OK, the country's breaking up into different areas. Which area represents my views the most? I mean, there's there's places for me right now, my priorities, which which states have not enacted lockdowns in, re, in, re, uh, in response to this COVID-19, which ones aren't requiring masks, 
which ones are actually taking steps to prevent this thing from being used as uh, basically permanent authoritarianism? Mm -hmm. You know, those are that we may see that we may see an East West German style situation in America where different parts of the country are ruled by basically the police state and others are more free. And if that's the case, I, I, I would be, I, it would be a difficult decision, but I'd be strongly considering moving to an area that had seceded in, in that sense from, from this whole lockdown stuff. But if it were to occur, occur literally like Texas were to declare itself a republic, I might be, tempted, especially with the real estate prices down there, I might be tempted to go, yeah. you know, pull a Davy Crockett and say, you know, I'll go to hell. I'm going to Texas. <laughs> okay. So we've talked about uh, how you got into writing a little bit, but fiction writing, that seems so difficult to me. You know, I, I don't think I could ever pull that off. Uh, can you give us a little bit more about your, your process with fiction writing or, you know, why you choose to do that because uh, you've written what six books and you just published one in like late 2020 so that just seems like such a foreign concept to me can you give us a little peek into that whole world <laughs> yeah i i would say actually it's funny you mentioned the hard part of writing it's actually gotten increasingly hard for me to write i think that that's partly where I just don't have the energy anymore. When I was in my early 20s, I was churning out thousands of words a day. I was just couldn't wait to go spend some couple hours writing. And I think part of it is I just, a lot of it was kind of li literary vomit. It was me just dumping stuff onto the page. And being a writer now, when I'm a bit older, I like to think a little bit wiser, you tend to hold stuff back in your writing. And more, and I'm moving towards a more understated type of prose where I don't want to just dump everything. And the other part of it is you realize people are not going to read a 300 page, unless you're a really established author or you've written a really, a, a really good book. Uh, people aren't going to read 300 pages. Uh, the other thing is I really, I'm doing a lot of other stuff now that I used to not do. I didn't own a home uh, and was working on projects, but I've got I just, I've, I've divided my time a lot more than what I used to be doing. So I'm not doing as much writing as I've been doing now. I've, I've been working on a new novel for the past couple of months, but I've been going at a very slow pace. Uh, and I think at the same time, you have to like know what you're wanting to write. And also there's the creativity. So I'm wor working on a science fiction based novel and I'm not a science fiction writer. So I'm having to sit there and think about all this different stuff that, and I, but I don't want to overbuild the world. I, I'm having a book coming out that's a fantasy novel, but it's a very bare bones fantasy novel. It doesn't. I'm not spending 300 pages talking about the the color of the bark on the tree on the battlefield where the elves are going to fight, or something that Tolkien would probably do. Right. <laughs> um, and so it's the same thing with science fiction book. I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, building a world. I want to get straight to the point. But it, then you got to realize, okay, how much do I leave out? Like, how detailed am I? Uh, things like that. And I do want to say, I've actually written a bunch of unpublished novels. Uh, one of them was massive. It was the length of Les Mis, like a thousand pages or something like that. Wow. And I'm definitely not publishing a thousand page book. I'm probably <laughs> going to cut it. If I was ever going to publish it, I cut it down to probably 300 um, at most or, or something like that. So I've got a lot of books that I've written over the years, but I just, I wrote them and I moved on. Uh, I just don't know if I ever want to publish them because they were written at it. I was a lot younger and had a different perspective on the world. So it's just a question of, you know, was it was just a lesson learned. But I can see why people don't get into create, don't get into fiction unless they're going to do short stories or something like that. Right. <laughs> now, of the books that you have published, they're all fantasy slash dystopian. Would that be fair to say? How would you describe? I actually that? wrote a bunch. <laughs> My I, I actually a little eclectic in the genres I write. I've written a bunch of dystopian novels. There was a, a couple of them uh, based in Seattle. And what happened is I'd written a novel that's based, set in the 30s called Men Who Walk Alone. And it's if you like Humphrey Bogart, you'll like people will like the book. But I showed it to a literary agent. He said the problem is you wrote a 1930s book for a 1930s audience. And so I thought, hmm. So, but I 
I was really into the 30s, and I, I'm still kind of in that way for people who can see the typewriter behind me. I, so I thought, okay, what do I do? Well, I thought maybe I should set the past in the future. So I was inspired by what happened after the uh, Edward Snowden revelations came out, the NSA stuff. Well, I read some post about how the Kremlin had ordered typewriters to start typing out classified information because the argument was Stone had walked away with a lot of intelligence, U.S. intelligence, on a thumb drive or some like small file carrier. Whereas if he had been forced to carry it physically, he couldn't have been as discreet and he also couldn't have carried as much. And so the idea was that they were going to use retro technology to preserve and protect their information. So I thought, so this is an example of people using old technology to combat new technological issues. So in the book, the stringers, uh, the people in the city of Seattle, a lot of them, they don't use the internet. They don't use any kind of new technology. They are completely offline, no phones. They use typewriters. Uh, they use the teletype to communicate with each other. They use radios. They use old, just old technology because everything in the future is cybersecurity based. Well, what happened? And that's how they control people. So what happened? How do you control someone who doesn't, who isn't online? I mean, this is something that we look at today where you can easily cancel somebody online just by, uh, you know, by what they say, but also limiting their access to stuff online. Whereas, you know, imagine somebody who everything that they use is offline. Um, other books that I've written are more of, uh, how do I put it? I'd say either espionage or some sort of thriller. But then there's also the, that's the cover for one of my books. That's, uh, if you like Beowulf and you've read Beowulf, that, so I wrote it in a old Anglo-Saxon uh, poetic style, which was also difficult. That was probably the hardest one I've ever written. Wow, that, that sounds particularly interesting to me. Uh, it, was, have... it was hard. Oh, go ahead. Is that one for sale through your website? The one behind you? Yeah, there's actually also an... Yeah, there's an audiobook version that I really recommend people get because I had oh, wow. a, a, a friend from Holland. Yeah, he actually narrated it, and he was he was trained how to speak English by an English teacher, like someone from England. So he's Dutch, but he has an English accent when he speaks English. So it creates this very interesting accent when he was narrating this book that I was I thought that was perfect. So I managed to get him to do it. That sounds awesome. So you have published six books have a ton that you decided not to do and you have one of them just one turned into an audiobook or do you have multiple yeah I'm, I'm working on i need to do the yeah i need to do the audiobook for the pilgrims digress they they want the author to do it and so I've got wow. a, <laughs> just another another wow. another project that i've got going on on top of writing this latest book wow do you ever sleep i guess is the next question <laughs> You are busy. Oh uh, not as much, not as much as uh, not as much as I used to. Right. All right. Well, let's talk about your newest book. If I am correct, it, you published it in late 2020. It's called Pilgrim's Digress. Right. That's the newest. Right. Okay. Uh, yes, that's the newest one. You sent me a copy. I have. Uh, I have not read all of it, but I did read a lot of it, and. I like it. Your writing is very riveting and I just ran out of time. It's one of those things I saw, I think it was an Amazon review that, you know, it was just a really easy read, not because it wasn't compelling, but because it was, you know, the, the classical page turner and not super long either. It was like a hundred pages or so, but uh, I will finish that and I'm going to have right. my kids read it too. So anyway, let's dive into it. The Pilgrim's Digress. Can you give listeners an overview of this post-dystopian novella. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the best way to describe it is think of The Handmaid's Tale, except the, the leaders of the good guys. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of when Dan Carlin described the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar as the Star Wars saga, but told from Darth Vader's perspective. And so right. I thought, I was thinking about that when I kind of wrote the, a little bit when I wrote this book of, okay, I, I was, I just watched a TV show about bounty hunters. It was an anime show, an actually good one from the late 90s called the Cowboy Bebop. And so I was really interested in bounty hunters, wanted to tell a bounty hunter story. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to do it in space because that's already been done. Didn't want to do it in the Old West. That's been done to death too. I mean, Clint Eastwood owns that kind of thing. So I was like, okay, so what are we going to do with that? Well, then I was looking at a lot of these 
ethical issues at the same time where people were, especially, I don't want to say libertarian, but like having debates with people about what is acceptable in society as long as it's not hurting you. And what I was watching is kind of the gradual narrative shift of that we've seen, especially I, I can from my childhood growing up is people go from, you know, leave me alone. I'm not harming you to, oh, this is good. Oh, you need to accept me. Oh, we're going to force you to accept us. So quickly you see how people will, their, their advocacy and stance changes as they gain more power in society. They go from being the victim and the oppressed to the oppressor. And so what would justify a theocracy? And then I started looking at questions of, well, our government, the state of Washington acts like a church in every function possible. Because if you, I was re also reading a lot about medieval Europe and reading about how much uh, the, the church, the Catholic, Roman Catholic church had its own court systems. It had a lot of power over people's lives, not necessarily through coercion or through the, the government, but just people believe that if you were excommunicated, you were not going to go into heaven. You wouldn't be able to get communion. You had to, they did all these things based on a sincere belief in whatever it was. And so I see the same thing here in my area. So I, it's at the point where I'm saying, so we talk a lot about separation of church and state. And you hear that a lot from people who want to control the church and religion, traditional religions like Christianity. But at what point does the state act like a church? Like at what point, because you don't have to call yourself something to be something. You don't, like that cliche line from Shakespeare, a rose is a rose by any other name. Well, a theocracy is a theocracy, whether you want to call it one or not. We're not called the theocratic state of Washington, but that doesn't change the fact that there's certain things that are accept that are in, in, in regular practice and use and commonly accepted as a, a faith. Like it's not, it's not something you're legally required to believe, but there are ramifications when you don't believe it and they're not to be questioned. So that's what the book really looks at is, as one of my friends who did a review on it, he was saying how it really makes you think about what is religion and what, what, is, what's a sec, what does secularism look like? What, what does that actually mean? At what point is it no longer a secular thing, but it's a religious concept? Yes, and the bounty hunters are the Puritans in the book, and they're responsible for enforcing decency laws, and shutting down the perverts and the pornographers and stuff. So how did your faith play a part in your character development with choosing the Puritans? Because you have Puritan ancestry, but you also had mentioned the secular Puritanism, which you know kind of rules um, woke places today. Uh, how did that all occur? Well, it's interesting that I used the, I, I didn't really, it didn't really occur to me why I said use the word Puritan as the bounty hunters. I guess I was just trying to think of, I wanted to do a minimalistic book and not go into too much details about the society. So using a few placeholders really helped give people kind of the idea of what the society looked like aesthetically and having, and also I didn't realize this necessarily at the time, or I think maybe I, it was in the, in the back of my mind, but uh, the Puritans didn't call themselves Puritans. That was a prerogative, uh, a negative term or slang term that people used to describe them. They just they call themselves separatists or something else. So it kind of goes back to that roots of them being called something in the negative, but it becomes something today nobody sees necessarily sees Puritan as a a negative thing. Puritanical or or something like that is probably the the more negative use. But I also wanted people to I'm trying to think of uh, what the, the the question had to do with um, oh how the faith um, I actually it's not a book about theology so for people who read the book this is not a book about puritanism in the traditional sense or separatism separatism it's not a book about really it's not even a book about religion necessarily uh, in the in the sense that it's debating whether there's no debates over whether the religion is true there's no debates over right. the theological questions the questions are more of how do you incorporate your faith into the political world and how do you express it in that sense and you know mine is looking at it from a as a religious i consider myself to be a religious minority in my state so you know how do i <laughs> how do i feel um where i'm not and, and also what arguments am i hearing from people who are justifying for example authoritarianism by the state to enforce their religious beliefs mm -hmm. 
there was a term actually used in the Seattle School District where they were describing how certain peoples were committing spiritual violence against other members of the, the schools. And they use a lot of religious words, which I did. They, the book came out before they used that term in public. And I was like, God, I, I wish they I wish they'd done that before because I could incorporated that. Because, um, example, see what all the stuff we hear about, like how, you know, no one, we, we can't tolerate hate, right? We'll replace hate with heresy. Right. Um, you know, this person's a racist. Okay, replace racist with heretic. Um, somebody's a, a bigot. Okay, replace that with someone's a, uh, or, or my favorite is when people say, oh, that he's a climate denier. Okay, he's a Christ denier. Like same, different, different terms, but the exact same meaning applies. This is somebody who denies a tenant of our faith and is a threat to our belief system and needs to be treated as a pariah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I like one of the uh, re- reviews of your book by Andy Nowicki. In the Pilgrim's Digress, T.J. Martineau envisages the establishment of a future tradition-based society that is part M. Night Shyamalan's The Village and part Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, except this time around, the patriarchal theocrats are the good guys. <laughs> I read that, you know, before I was perusing the novella and, you know, I wanted to read it even more. So can, let's expound a little bit more upon that. uh, Why you think this may be a good idea, if it is a good idea, that the church must be involved in the government somehow, or there maybe can't be a separation or the turbulent era is what you use in the book. That's the collapse. Uh, is that a faith-based, Christian-specific going to be necessary to rebuild once it all takes place? So basically just parse out the whole, the patriotic, patriarchal theocrats are the good guys. You already did a little bit, but uh, give us some more info on that. It's juicy. Right. So I think that, one of the things, I, so I was coming out of my libertarian, like I, I'm still, I still have, <laughs> I'm an American, so I'm always going to have that libertarian strain yeah. in me. Yeah. But I was coming out of it from a, uh, uh, from a, I guess, more of a practical academic perspective and saying, okay, what are some of the problems with just leaving people alone from, a, not from a position of power, but from a position of just an ordinary citizen who's advocating that everybody be left alone? or that they should run themselves because things don't occur in a vacuum. And that's one of the things that this book, this book looks at is things, uh, governments don't come out of nowhere. Uh, The types of governments don't just appear The the government and the people have to be appropriate for each other. So this is an example of this was during the Iraq war. They were talking about how we were going to spread democracy to the middle East. Yet the, that doesn't materialize because they're, they're tribal based. So tribal based, uh, people's democracy is a, regardless of how people feel about democracy, even in a classical Athenian sense, democracy just isn't a, the people, the people don't want democracy. So then you end up with, you know, having to force people to be free. That was one argument that someone was making about libertarianism is that you would have to force people around the world to be free. And that leads to why uh, a lot of globalist stuff and a lot of, and some libertarians go hand in hand because it involves spreading free <laughs> forcing freedom you know uh, but the other thing i would say is that an example i use is in our state we have a lot of unhealthy forests because they were being actively managed through logging and timber harvesting and then they suddenly stopped it all as a result of that they are in an unnatural state they're not healthy and there's people who want to argue that kind of the they, they've watched too much pocahontas they've watched too much fern Gully, that old environmental film and they're like we should just leave nature as it is and not actively manage it. And what most people are understanding now is they are not in a natural state. So you have to go in there and restore it back to its healthy state, just leaving it alone. They, those forests are not gonna recover. They're gonna just go, uh, they're gonna go up in flames. It's the same thing with people. One of the things that people that they don't, we don't account for is we have entire generations that have been educated by the state. Not by the not privately, not through traditional American schooling, through the church or whatever. They've been educated by the state. So the idea that if they were just let go one day, they're going to form a natural, normal, healthy society, I don't think is very realistic because they've spent whole generations where they don't know what things used to be like 100 years ago. 
or, or I'd say 130 years ago, public education is a relatively new thing. And the Prussian model of education is a relatively new thing. And yet that's what, for most people today, the idea that you educate someone outside of a room without a desk there, or in, in a certain collective sense, to them, they can't imagine what that's like. And so the idea in the book is that you, you know, on top of just violence being necessary at some point, and there's certain, you know, anecdotes in the book that kind of highlight that. At some point, you have to force, at some point, they felt justified in using force as, as there's that one line that Amos says, you know, his son asks him, well, forcing people to do the right thing doesn't make them good. And he says, I don't care if it makes them good. If it, that's what I need to do to protect my liberties and my ability to do what's right, then that's what I'm going to do. And that's a, another thing that the book looks at is uh, it, life is about the, the best choice, not the, the best hypothetical. Uh, as, as, some person, as some people would say, what's the alternative to, if you don't like A, what's the alternative? And if the alternative is worse, then that's the best choice. And sometimes people get hung up on that because they say, well, you know, in La La Land, we could have, you know, this happen. Well, that's not, that's not, a, it's like going into a, a pizza place and ordering Thai food. It's, it, we don't serve Thai food here. That's not, that's not an option in this, this scenario. And so the uh, the other thing is that when you when you treat people badly or oppress people, or persecute people, you give them legitimate grievances and legitimate reasons to want to expel you from <laughs> expel you from their area. I, there, there's a reason why, in a lot of cases, you know, the Puritans expelled people from their communities. One, because they had a lot of people who were trying to undermine their communities. But also, um, when you're a persecuted people, you are very sensitive to anyone coming in and presenting a threat to you. That's why uh, a, a lot of formerly persecuted minorities uh, in Europe, like uh, Jewish communities or whatever, they became very insular and suspicious of outsiders and they didn't want people coming in. So it kind of, that, that it's also looked at in this book where they, they did what the American founding fathers did to the loyalists after the War of Independence. They kicked them out to, to Canada, they kicked them out to Quebec, they, they kicked them out of the country because it's, it's like, you can't have people inside your your country especially when it's fragile who are going to possibly disrupt it or act as a fifth call yeah and i've written my fair share about what i call puritanical progressivism and i, I wrote a five-part series uh, a long time ago and one of the things was i have no problem with the puritans in new england and massachusetts specifically saying this is how <laughs> we do it and right. if you don't like it hit the road I have no problem with that. It's when it started growing and, you know, going to other places and saying, oh, you will do this. So, and again, that was more, you know, I think becoming Unitarian at that point when it started, you know, spreading to the, the See, South Island and stuff. Go ahead. That's definitely interesting. I've, I, because I've always been fascinated by how the Puritan New England really started to become the, like, their. Their, their religious stuff now is, is total garbage, but it's been garbage for since the 1800s when they I, there was the transcendentalist movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there was definitely, it was almost like the people who grew up, I, my, my gut feeling is telling me that by the 1800s, the people who lived there, the ancestors of the Puritans from the 1700s, they, they kept the culture, but they tossed out the, the religion yeah. entirely. And they said, okay, we're gonna be Unitarian. And then you combine Unitarianism with the city on a hill Mm -hmm. uh, type thing from Governor Winthrop's speech. And I think that that just changed whatever it was. But also, I think a lot of them are, are, hated their forefathers. I mean, Hoth, a lot of them just didn't like, they did not like dad. It was kind of a, I'm mad at dad thing. Like Hawthorne right. wrote, you know, the Scarlet Letter and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they, they theologically completely rejected because Pur Puritans were very specific about uh, the way that you were saved. And it, in, in a lot of cases, it was over the board. Like you had to constantly, you know, ensure that you were saved or something like that. Whereas these people are like, oh, you know, everyone's welcome. <laughs> right? right? Probably a reaction to that. Uh, but yeah, it's, again, it goes to the, how like culture shapes politics and not the other way around because a, a country can survive a bad government, but a, a good government can't rescue a, as the book kind of, is hinting at um, in, in later on, uh, a good government can't rescue a bad people or yeah. a bad or bad people in the government. 
Yeah, very well said. And I, the book does do a really good job with that. And back to kind of the, the libertarianism thing. I myself used to be a libertarian, still have those tendencies, have a lot of good libertarian friends. But one of the things for me was, oh, well, you know, pornography is just speech. And if you would want to regulate that in your utopia, uh, you know, you're a horrible person who doesn't want people to be free, you know? And I would say, well, I don't want to, I would not want my children to live in a place where there is pornography easily available. And, you know, isn't it all about, you know, private property and, um, you know, leaving each other alone? Well, my little utopia would not have pornography and you could just leave, right? You know, go like William Penn and start your own state, right? So <laughs> that was one of the things for me and your book does a really good job critiquing pornography. And then you use sex bots too, which I find fascinating because I kind of see it as like, are you critiquing technocracy? I kind of see it like you're critiquing COVID isolationism too, and feminism. Like I see it all happening there because I think my personal opinion is sex bots are becoming a thing because women are so horrible to be around. So <laughs> other than me, but what, why? I didn't, I didn't say that guys. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. That was me. You know, I, I, yeah, Tell me why I, was, you I was reading it. an essay by this. He's a, yeah, I was reading an essay. Actually, this partly inspired this book. It was uh, I was reading an essay by a retired Marine and also a reporter uh, named Fred Reed, and he was writing a column about sex bots and the ethics behind it. And he was saying, like, what happens if to the point where they're able to program them to think like a child and act like a child? Yeah. Like, where's the where's the boundaries with that? And I, you know, this is dark stuff, and I really didn't intend to write a dark book, but. I was thinking of the libertarian argument was, mm -hmm. well, as long as they're on their own property and they're not hurting anyone. And the, the thing is, is like, that's like someone setting up their, their house on fire and it's right next to mine and saying, well, as long as the flames don't touch yours. Right. Well, by the time that happens, I don't like it's, it's over. By the time the fire comes over to my house, it's, I'm already fully engaged. This is to use the wildfire analogy. This is another problem in my state. You have state, the, uh, the, Department of Natural Resources, you have BLM, Bureau of Land Management, you then have Fish and Wildlife, and then you have the Forest Service. So if a fire starts on one of those jurisdictions, the other one's not, you know, it's not their jurisdiction. And this is becoming less of a problem because they realize, well, that wildfire is not going to just stop because it's not being opposed by the Forest Service. It's on DNR land. So they understand, well, if there's DNR land here and we got Forest Service right here and it starts here, we, we, it, it affects us if this wildfire starts coming over onto our land. And the same thing with private you know, ranchers and, and private uh, small forest landowners. Yeah, it affects them when the, the land next to them, the forest land, is not properly managed and it's high risk of, uh, of a mega wildfire. So it's the same thing with if my the idea that what goes on on my neighbor's property does, and, and what my neighbor is, what he does, doesn't affect me. That, that just doesn't play out in the long term. It does, that may play out in a might in in a in an anecdotal sense, but if my neighbor is engaging in a behavior, I'll just throw out something about the, the argument you were hearing from people about this stuff. That is that the desire to be included is always advocated by someone who needs other people to enable their behavior. People who, who live sustainable lives, they don't need to be they, they're not obsessed with being included in groups. There, there's two different types of people in the world. There's people who want to be included, and then there's people who want to be who want to exclude other people. I'm not saying it's necessarily on a moral or superiority thing, but it's a mindset of do I think my way doesn't require other people? Yeah. And so when we see all these kind of morally people who engage in morally degenerate behavior, they're 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 drug addicts, they're they're drunkards, they're um, they, they engage in you know they're shysters, they're they're it's kind of like the same thing I've said about people who are obsessed with ensuring that borders are open around, you know, they'd be able to come and to go in anywhere. It's because there's consequences, and ramifications for their behavior. They're, they're snake oil salesmen, they're engaging in pyramid schemes. So they want to go in into an area, exploit people and then leave without being held accountable for their actions. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, that mindset that, you know, leave me alone, let me do whatever I want. That's the mindset of somebody who is obsessed with not being held accountable. And that also doesn't lead to long-term sustainability for a community. Uh, this is why so many communities fall apart is because they engage, 
they allow behavior that is not sustainable in, in, the, in the long run. You know, having people who show up and co are constantly coming and going, you've got new residents and then people are selling their homes and then they're move, moving around and there's no attachment. At some point, people don't have the same mindset as somebody like when I went to Normandy, France, and I was in these small towns where people, had, their ancestors, I use the train, uh, the ancestors had been there for a thousand years. I mean, I, I, I can only imagine, I, I saw one person's uh, uh, a building that had been owned by the same French family for 500 years. So their mindset about that community, about its well-being, about its long-term health and what's good for it, it's going to be completely different from somebody who showed up to get a tech job and is just interested in making easy money. And the moment he doesn't like what's going on, he can just, and he can vote to raise taxes the moment then he doesn't like paying the taxes. It's like, oh, well, I'm going to sell my home for a million dollars, move to Texas and buy an expansion for 300,000. And that there's no ramifications, but if you're actually tied to that community, that, that those actions affect you. So I, whenever somebody says, you know, he has this very, leave me alone, I do whatever I want. I'm not saying that they're necessarily doing something they shouldn't be doing or that should be controlled, but it's definitely something, somebody who is not interested in also the well-being of people around them. And they're not somebody that you can trust. Right. Yeah, it's a balance. You know, we can have individualism and collectivism. And you've mentioned the key word as you're speaking, you said community. And back to your fire analogy, you know, the guy whose his house is burning down or whatever, you know, he may be just thinking, oh, well, I'm going to get insurance money, whatever. You know, it may be about money to him. Right. You know, he's putting man above God, man above his community, himself and whatever his, you know, instantaneous desires are above, you know, the well-being of others. And it is, it's a, um, it's a symbiotic thing that I think some libertarians miss. Um, a lot of Americans miss that because I, I think they do just say, oh, leave me alone, you know, and I can do whatever I want. Yet those tend to be the people that are asking for people's help all the time too. So I find that intriguing. And <laughs> Right. And back to the sex bot thing you had described in the book where well, the character said that they are lacking the spark of the divine separating men from all other creatures and i thought that was just a beautiful way to kind of bring to the fore this whole fakeness that uh you know we're kind of living in you know i know your book is fiction but you know this critiquing of our modern ethical standards or lack thereof uh so it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Well, it's crazy you, you mentioned that one. Mm -hmm. It's crazy you mentioned that because I just saw, uh, I just posted on Twitter the other day, there was a Facebook ad I saw for an AI that an AI like chat bot that develops its personality based on how you respond to it. And it's basically like an AI uh, companion. So I, what I'm seeing with that is that is how desperate people are for interaction where they they're seeking out artificial interactions with someone but frankly i'm kind of just seeing a lot of people behaving that way anyways where they're behaving more like uh an android like a robot where they've got a very specific program and so i that, that line uh, i remember writing that line but i was like thinking of a lot of people i've known where they don't have there's something that's just dead inside of their gates they're not they're not really there and so I, I thought, I just think that that's going to be interesting to have this, we're, we're really like spiritually, it's a very dead society today um, in terms of how much, even though it's a religious society, it's not, there's not a lot of like meaningful spirituality and that doesn't necessarily have to be tied to say a reli religion specifically, but it's like, Everything is very sterile. Mm -hmm. I think is a, is a bet, probably the best way to do it. Uh, a lot of things involve, uh, and for, for, I think that that probably explains why people are so content with this lockdown, at least in some parts of my region, where people are content to basically be online all day long and then go play online video games and then chat with people on text messages and basically never interact, never touch another human being, never whatever it was like, you know, I'm, so, I'm out there like basically just diet swimming into my, my garden, just trying to like get some sort of like real life, you know, 
I, I have to be out in the, the mountains uh, around me. I have to go out hiking. I got to go, you know, uh, jump into the creek or whatever. I, I got to be out there in, in the real world in nature. And a lot of people just, they're, they're fine. With, I know some people who have never left their homes in the past year. They've been in their house for the most part. I mean, they'll go out a little bit, but they're content with just being inside. Yeah. I mean, I, I know those people exist, but, and I can't even imagine, you know, and then you, you think of the, the spark of the divine and you see that in a human's face and their interaction with other people. And now we cover up most of their face and, you know, it is, it's, it's dark, <laughs> it's dark times and, and uh, <laughs> everybody yeah. would uh, do a lot better going out and getting their vitamin D and, um, you know, creating community, but, uh, you know, I think the separation, you can see people who are wanting to do the things that we want to do and not, and I think it's becoming abundantly clear who are, uh, <laughs> who are the people who have a spark left and who uh, aren't, and it's, uh, it's pretty stark. And I, I do think that, I think I may have talked with you about this during your interview with me, but, you know, I just think a lot of those people are not reachable. You talk about kind of that, that dead fish eye that some people have, you know, they say that a lot of uh, younger people today who have been, you know, early education, gone to college forever, they don't have an inner monologue, you know, uh, they don't I, yeah, talk I, with like... themselves. <laughs> I've, I've read that and I don't understand it because I'm thinking, uh, you know, uh, one guy, I think it was, I can't remember who it was, but they said, these people don't have an inner voice. I'm like, you only have one? Because <laughs> yeah. I like, I, yeah, I, I, the idea that I don't have a constantly running, I'm not saying like constant running monologue in, in a uh, sense, but like I'm always thinking or like talking things out and in a, in a, and I'd say in a positive sense, not in a, like a negative sense, right. but I'm always thinking like, okay, this garden, <laughs> you know, what do I want to do with this garden? Or uh, with the lawn, like how am I going to take care of the lawn? And then I'm also thinking about books. So people are are asking about how you how I write. Well, when I'm on my when I'm up hiking up the mountain, I I typically don't listen to a podcast or any music or anything like that. I'm just sitting there working out a scene yeah. and saying, does, does how does this feel? And also for to be a fiction writer, you have you have to have kind of I think a combination of two things. You have to have empathy. Uh, the capacity to understand people whose lives you've never experienced. And then also you have to partly have life experience because there's a lot of emotions that and, and behaviors that you really don't understand until you either talk to someone who, who has dealt with that stuff or you've actually gone through it yourself. Uh, there was like, there was that scene from the Alamo, uh, the 1961 with John Wayne, where he's out with Jim Bowie and it's like 1 a.m. in the morning you know, everyone else is partying in the cantina and they're just sitting there quietly drinking whiskey or something like that and just talking about life. I did not understand that scene at all or just the, the context of it as two men to be sitting there talking about stuff until I got to be in my late 20s and 30s where I was sitting there with my my buddies of, of a couple of years. You know, we'd be having a good bourbon and just talking about life. So that I think that that's partly what, what goes on, but yeah, people, I, I wonder, <clears throat> I, I'm very concerned about what's going to go on with the next generation where they, we, we saw with the 80s, like the Gen Xers were all rebels, you know, at least at, the, at that time, you know, they, everybody was, it was cool to be a rebel. It seems like now it's okay to be a dork. Like it's, it's totally acceptable to be a, a dweeb, to be a, uh, a melodramatic little, little uh, snitch to be a, an emotionally unstable man. I, I just don't, I, I just see that. And it's, I don't, I don't know. It's it kind of scares that we are not, we're not, there are no rebel. There are no future rebels. I, I see some of them. I've got a, I've got a shirt that, that has a picture of George Washington with an X-Wing fighter outfit. And it says <laughs> rebel scum at the bottom. Some guys laugh at it. I think some of them just, I, the other thing I noticed in, in the millennial generation, they are very literal. They do not understand nuance or playful yeah. banter mm -hmm. all that stuff yeah and I, I i'm not sure what that is but man trying to have a conversation with people is very difficult because i i can't reference i, I know a lot of book quotes and a uh, and a lot of you know shakespeare i also know a lot of old movies like casablanca mm -hmm. maltese falcon all that kind of stuff 
I can't reference any of that stuff because none of them have ever heard of it. And they also say, well, what is it? They're like that guy from Guardians of the Galaxy, the one who, you know, they say, he, he, they don't understand metaphors. Everything just goes over his head. He says, nothing goes over my head. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you a millennial? What would you describe? I that? am, but I have, this is what, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a millennial, but one of the problems with the, I, I have with the generational classification is there's a totally different there's a total gap between people who were born before yeah. the internet and people who were born after so i grew up i know what it was like to have an encyclopedia in your house i know what it's like to go have a library card and go have to like look in a library index file to find a library book that you want and and there not be any computers there and i remember what it was like to have the to have dial up and have all this stuff whereas a lot of these millennials they don't even know what it's like to have dsl they've always had decent internet and they they've grown up with smartphones so but i'm a millennial but i've always actually found myself i was more at home with uh i used to talk a lot with quite a few world war ii vets and i always felt i had more in common with them in terms of uh mindset than than people in my own generation they just uh, and maybe it was also just they were they were older and some of the stuff they wanted to talk about was the same stuff but i don't know they just had the same attitude that I really liked. Uh, even though they were old, they, they still had kind of this boyish adventurism about them. They hadn't, uh, they didn't feel like they were just tired with life. Mm -hmm. Like I see with a lot of people now. Um, but millennials also tend to have zero interest in history. They tend to have zero interest in um, their own family's history. Uh, they, they tend to not be interested in, in heritage. Uh, they're also have a very Orwellian, it's almost like they don't care about what happened like the past doesn't exist anymore. If that makes it, it, they, they, yeah. it, 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 it's as though it's as though before 2020, nobody died. Uh, nobody ever died and nobody ever got the flu and nobody ever coughed. Mm -hmm. Right. Th th that's their capacity to like forget the past or something like that. Uh, and uh, I think also they tend to be more, they think that being a conformist is being like edgy or controversial. <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> it's a very dorky, it's just a very dorky culture. Like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to an LGBTQ, they, they talk about going to an LGBTQ rally in Seattle, like they're going to some, you know, really, uh, like going to a rock concert, you know, you grew up in a conservative household, you're going to, to watch ACDC in the 80s or something <laughs> like that, you're going to be edgy. It's like, okay, I don't know. That's, at least that's what, the, what I've experienced. Yeah. There's nothing less stunning and brave than that, pretty much. <laughs> but I agree with you. <laughs> there should be little descriptors or book places, you know, b between the generations, because I agree with you, too, that, uh, you know, I mean, I guess we got to label things and somebody makes these things up, but there should be some kind of nuance in there. Right. I will say, you know, my kids are... Uh, the Zoomers, as they say, Gen Z. And one thing I see with them, now it could be the kids I'm hanging out with, but uh, they're very skeptical, which I like. But it, you know, kind of goes back to your right. book. It has to be filtered through, you know, through God, through the Bible, or else, you know, you could just kill yeah. yourself with all that skepticism and be a super miserable person. So that kind of leads me to my next question. Right. Without giving too much away from the book, I think I can mention this because I think it was on the Amazon description, but the story also involves a conspiracy that reaches the highest levels of the church. So you're kind of at, you are kind of advocating for uh, the authority of, uh, you know, the church and uh, theocracy and uh, Christian-based ethics, but there's, you know, a twist in there too. Is this just a critique of right. abuse of power that you see happening in the American church today? Uh, subversion within Christianity, faith in man over God. Why did you put that in there? You know, I was working on this book and I was actually originally going to have it be a straight, inter straight, or I'd say more black and white, where the church is just absolutely the good guys. They are led by great, great people and everything's fine. And it's always just, and these are just the bad guys. And the question is, okay, how does the book end? Like what, what, what is the takeaway of the book? I, it, for people who haven't seen the movie Cromwell, um, I, that was partly I, what was where I walked away. It was one of the most unnerving endings of any film I've ever watched because it was like watching Macbeth, except Macbeth is the good guy at the end where, you know, Macbeth at the end, of, which is a very tragic 
Shakespearean play about a guy who rises to the height of power and then is brought down by his own hubris. Whereas this film paints Cromwell giving this a, a very Shakespearean speech and then it ends with him basically being draped in white robes and he's a saint or something like that. But him taking power over all of England was seen as like this very righteous holy. And I, and it's, like, you know, they got the choir scene and all that stuff. And I was just like, and then it, the movie went dark and I'm like, that's really, really, really weird. And so I thought, okay, so how does my book end? What message or takeaway is that? And I think it was also just partly the, the, my natural tendency to not like to paint this kind of Thomas Kincaid, uh, Norman Rockwell depiction of, of the world. But also it got at the issue, uh, I'd say that I see with, and I think that the American founding fathers saw this as they were going out the door lifespan wise, is that the people who didn't have a hand in the fight don't treat their liberties or the, they, they're not as interested in preserving the integrity of an institution and because they didn't have to fight for it. People who had a hand in the fight are going to have a different attitude. So in this book, there are very few older people. Amos is only is the oldest one. And he's I didn't say his name, but he was probably in his late 40s, early 50s. Everybody else is like in their 30s or 20s. So that was another interesting thing that's a reverse from our society is that Today, we're, we're basically ruled by the geriatric society, uh, you know, like the AARP. It's all a bunch of old people who are basically, you know, one step away from ending up in the senior living home. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we held Congress one day from a senior living assisted care center or something like that. So I thought it would be interesting to have it be a society where it's young, the young are in leadership. And that's, I think, the biggest sign of a decay in our society, in our country, is that we have a bunch of very old people running things and it's not just that there's some old people it is all old people there are no there are almost no millennials of my generation or anybody who's really genuinely young there's very few of them and so their voice is not being heard but it also means that the young aren't really being they're not being allowed to invest in the country or its future the future, their future is being determined by, by other people who are keeping them out of power, in my opinion. And I see this everywhere. I've seen this in churches. Um, I see this in organizations, in nonprofits, in uh, local clubs, where you walk in and I look at the leader and say, what the leader tells you, it symbolizes is the epitome of what this organization values. And when it's some old guy who can barely, you know, walk across the stairs, th- that's that's bad sign. That's not a good thing. And so when people always talk about, oh, we how do we turn things around? Well, you got to you got to get somebody in who's young and expects to live a little bit longer, because a lot of these people don't care about what happens to the country or to their organizations. Once they die, they just want to be in control until until they croak. Yeah. Or a person who, you know, doesn't have a retirement, doesn't have their house paid off, doesn't have right. doesn't know that they you know maybe no 401k uh definitely they know for a fact they're not getting their social security those kinds of things right yeah so yeah i get that too and especially you know we don't need to go off on a COVID tangent but uh oh yeah <laughs> you know, we all have to tweak our young healthy lives and i'm not young i'm almost 50 but you know i, I don't i'm in good health you know i don't need to tweak my life because what is it? Right. Two thirds of the people that have died in COVID in America, it's either one third or two thirds, whichever one it is, have been in these nursing homes. You know, I'm not in a nursing yeah. home, so I don't need to be doing this stuff. So yeah, I'm right there with you. Well, I've read uh, Fahrenheit 451 recently with my kids and I kind of saw this as like the flip of that. So Amos is like Guy Montag or eventually what Guy Montag becomes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good comparison. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so, you know, but Amos has the power, obviously Guy Montag doesn't. And then Amos's nemesis, nemesis Leonard Meyer would be the Captain Beatty of the book, but he's not burning books. He's the free speech advocate, activist, you know? So yeah. I just found that that's really interesting. Uh, I don't know. I think you actually that, did yeah, do that. that. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be my I dissertation for lit class right there. That would be it. Oh, that would <laughs> I gotta get I gotta get a college student to do that. So then he's like, <laughs> the professor's like, I gotta read this book. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's the I've read so many books, or they, they, there's always these dystopians, and they've always 
it's funny we're living in it's in my opinion a dystopia right now that like this is the <laughs> this is the dystopia that's why i call it a post dystopian novel because this is what i what what could come after that but it's always governments where it, they're always advocating for my values in a lot of cases not fahrenheit 451 necessarily uh or, or 1984 but in a lot of cases you, you know they're they ended up advocating for something that's actually possibly admirable but also i'd say what it's like with you know they always talk about uh, people fascism is uh, and rightfully so picked up a very uh, bad connotation calling someone a fascist is obviously uh means they're a bad person but th there's another question of someone who's reads my book and says well i don't like theocracy and it's like you don't that's not the point of the book the, the, yeah. the point of the book is what is the context that leads to theocracy coming about what comes what what I want to look at an authoritarian government that has a actual moral case that isn't based on deceit because so many authoritarian governments like from beef and vendetta or all these other uh, uh types of uh, totalitarian governments they're based on lies they're based on selling a lie whereas the thing that separates this government like in amos and the church they're not lying about who they are about what they're doing uh amos even says you know i'm not for free speech i'm not for you know, freedom of choice. The difference is I don't pretend to do that. You do. And so I think that that's what always frustrates me is I don't, I, what bothers me so much about our governments today and totalitarianism today is that it's dishonest. Just like, don't lie to, don't patronize. You just say, we're keeping you on lockdown because we like controlling you. It's like, okay, fine. Can we just get the charade out, out in the open and just say, we're suppressing your speech because we don't like it. Just say that, just say, we don't want you to go out there because we like being able to control where you're going. Well, thanks for being on. Like they can't even be honest with us about this. Whereas, you know, the the, the church in this book, they just say they they. I think that that was another thing. Oh, I forgot to mention this. There's that scene. I don't know if you got into the part about the architect um, who's going to be put in the stocks. I don't think so. Mm -mm. Oh, so okay, gotcha. Well, there's a scene in that book that actually is based on one of my ancestors, uh, the the one I mentioned, Thomas Joy. Oh, it, awesome. That actually happened to him. Yeah, so there was a debate over church membership, and he uh, got he was he was uh, referred to or described as an ardent lover of liberty, and that got him in trouble with Governor Winthrop. So I remember reading that story. And I was wow. like, he sounds like <laughs> he sounds a little bit like me. So uh, a little bit of a rabble rouser. So I thought, you know, how do you deal with these issues of balancing free speech with not uh, allowing people to undermine your your societal norms and cultural norms? And how do you not overreact if you're if you're trying to preserve something? You don't want to just be blindly enforcing it. And that's another thing that the Amos looks at is he's not an ideologue. He's not a zealot. He's he is very much concerned with preserving stuff, but he's always afraid of people not knowing why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and that's because if you look, a conformist conforms to whatever's around him. So uh, if you were if you were a Puritan in 1920s England you were a rebel. But if you were a Puritan in 1648 or 1650, you were conforming to the government at the time. And so what happens when people are doing the exact same thing? Because that's, I think, what a lot of cases that we have today is there's a lot of people who, they really probably don't believe it. They, it, they just conform. Like they, they will follow whatever uh, they're told and that makes them malleable. But the, I think you know, the, the, the potential is that the same people who are advocating for uh, left-wing ideologies today out of conformity, but what happens when they find themselves under the rule of a right-winger mm -hmm. who's enforcing conformity? I mean, are they going to suddenly turn rebel? Because re rebelling revolt involves a certain type of uh, mindset and psychological, uh, added, just a different psychology than someone who's, this is why we have people who, you know, grew up traditional and now they're you know, th their politics have completely changed in the last 20 years because right. it was really more of a conformity thing. It wasn't really based on anything that they fully understand. I see a lot of that in the church where people really don't know anything about what they believe. They don't know uh, what the Bible says about anything. They, they Going to church is like going to the country club. And so they, they see it as like a social institution rather than a, a spiritual institution, but also that's connected to themselves apart from the church itself. Right which is why I guess churches were losing membership before uh, the Wu flu, because they weren't teaching their 
children and grandchildren what it was all about. And people are like, well, I just may as well sleep in on Sunday. I mean, what is this all about? So you answered one of my... Well, they beg the question... Go ahead. Keep going. Oh, they just beg the question. It goes... This is also what inspired this book, as I was just saying. I I was looking at a couple of churches. I was having discussions with some pastors and talking to them about their churches and just the struggles they have. And they were saying how, like, people don't know why the church is there anymore. And I, I was looking at them thinking, well, you don't know why the church is yeah. there anymore, man. Like, other than giving you a job, other than giving you a job and, and, and uh, you know, you have a you have a uh, mortgage, not a mortgage necessarily, but, like, you got mouths to feed. Um, what is that church there for? Because you've, you've subcontracted or surrendered all that responsibility and duty to the government. The government does all the stuff that you would, the church used to do. And you aren't trying to reclaim any of that. So, yeah, this kind of was a final straw where people are just like, what is the purpose of this institution if the government's going to do all this stuff or not, it's not even going to allow us to do that stuff? You know, people aren't going to respect a, a, a spiritual institution that takes its orders from the government than just go to a government run church. Right. Right. And, you know, they've been like reeds in the wind to all the cultural stuff. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a wonder that people are not going to church uh, even before the Wu flu uh, came to us. So I, uh, one of my last questions was going to be, are we destined for a turbulent era or are we already living through it now? I think you already answered that one. Uh, do you want to uh, say anything else about that? And I like the term. Yeah, turbulent I think that era, we're definitely way. living. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'm trying to think of how I came up with it. I, I think it, I came up with the term because I wanted it to be very, yeah, I wanted it to be vague enough to where people's imagination could fill in the blanks, but also mm-hmm. where it kind of describes a, it wasn't just political, but it was a social and cultural and religious form of turbulence where it were just chaotic. Um, and, and also, I think it, it played off of the Irish Troubles, like it was referred to as the Troubles. And so I kind of yeah. like that term because it just, it summarized it just summarized in a sense, like it was a troubled time yeah. for the country's history. I, yes, we are definitely living in that. How long we've been living in it, I don't know. I, I when one could argue we've been living in it for a really long time, for decades, but I'd say it's really acceler- accelerated in the last 20 years. And where it's going to turn out, I honestly, I've, lo- I've, I've realized that the capacity for human degradation really doesn't know any bounds. Um, I know it's not sustainable. The question is, this is where I get a little distraught, is, is this going to end when I'm in my 30s or is this going to end when I'm in my 50s? Mm Because I kind of like to get to the part where we get over that and move on. Yeah. Um, And so in the meantime, I think the important thing for people who are are either young or they've got families is to focus on uh, rejecting lies. And because the moment you start accepting these, the, the lies that we're told, uh, that undermines people's ability to be effective. And I think that that's why there's so much, so much ineffectiveness in what's being done today is because people are willing to accept a lie, a fundamental lie, in order to compromise or like to arrive at, to promote a greater truth, they accept these lies or something like that. And there's so many variety of them. Um, it, it's so many levels of our society, culturally, socially, politically, we're a proposition nation, we're one nation under God. Uh, the you know men and women are the same or all pretty much they you know take your pick on stuff i think that that way once things get so chaotic that people are willing to actually look for stability and order again yeah. they're going to people who have kind of held on to their sanity will help be able to help rebuild because they understand what went wrong i think the biggest problem for people is when things really go wrong, they're not going to understand why. Mm-hmm. When when hyperinflation occurs, they're not going to understand why. When um, when the urban areas or the suburban areas of cities uh, start falling apart, they're not going to understand why. <laughs> when their their all their daughters have fur babies instead of kids, uh, they're not going to understand why. <laughs> so it's going to be, it's definitely going to be. Uh, it will not be. It will not be an uneventful decade. Uh, it's just a question of whether we're going to experience some sort of turnaround where people are really going to become serious about not about changing stuff, or are they going to continue on into the descent and see how far it goes? I'm I'm more inclined towards the latter because people once they go as once they've gone down far enough the the path they 
they'll just, they're they're too committed to turn around. They've, mm -hmm. they've gone too far. Do you, you definitely think there will eventually be a social renewal? I am one thing. I'm very <laughs> how just I say, are you? <laughs> well, no. It's it, one thing I'm very much anti is <clears throat> I'm I'm very sensitive to anybody who says we're living in the end times. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been surrounded by a lot of, uh, I'm not sure it's post-millennial or, or pre, pre-dispositional, whatever, basically it's, we're in the living in the end times right now. And so let's obsess about Israel and let's not focus on anything else. Cause everything else has to get bad in order for the end times to arrive. And we have to, which incidentally makes them like think, oh, we've got to allow things to get bad. Cause then Jesus won't come back or something like that. Right. Uh, I think that that's possible. Uh, I don't. I think like I'd like to think, think that people have gone through worse times in history than us, and uh, the world didn't end. Uh, but at the same time, I, whether it does or not, I think it's good for people to be hopeful and to fight for it in whatever capacity is possible. Uh, whether it comes about in my lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, that may not that may not occur, but that doesn't mean that we just give up and get we we surrender and, and belly over. Uh, whenever somebody's coming to, to just destroy stuff, because at some point, this is kind of what the turbulent era, I, I think if I was going to describe it to someone is it's finally when they reached a point when the ordinary person couldn't stay on the sidelines, they had to choose whether to be complicit or to pick up a gun and start killing people. Right. And there's one, there's one, I'll give away one line, but there's this, there's this veteran of that era that was Amos's friend and he's this now this hard nosed, very cynical guy. And Amos is saying, "Yeah, but he was one of the nice guys. He was one of the quiet guys. Never bothered anybody. And then one day he just snapped and picked up a gun and started shooting." So, if that ever happens, it, watch the. I'm not saying watch the quiet guys. The NSA, when you're listening, don't listen to this. But it's 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 people are going to be shocked if there is kind of a pushback. You're you might be surprised by who the who are the people doing it. It could easily be Zoomers, young people, people who were uh, uh, victims of the whole transgender thing, um, who become the most zealot like. They're the most. They're the ones who are going to go out and be the, the witch, the witch finder generals, and the ones who are persecuting anyone uh, who had anything to do with it because they actually have a personal stake in this stuff. They, anyone who's actually suffered the results of that, where uh, you know, God forbid, it's like some fifty-year-old uh, in the future, some fifty-year-old former feminist who uh, never had any kids. She's the one who's like the most anti, the one who's persecuting feminists and getting them shut down. It may never happen, but I just, I think people need to be aware of, of psychology and the people who talk the loudest, it's a lot of bark, not a lot of bite. It's always the quiet guy in the bar that you watch out for. That's the veteran with PTSD who will, you know, slit your throat and not raise his heartbeat as he finishes his drink or something like that. So. <laughs> So, I, I mean, at least from what I've heard in the South. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, one of the things that makes me so distraught, but I'm not despairing, is that I do think it has to get worse before there can be a social reno renewal. You know, you hear sane people going, what the heck is it going to take? You know, my goodness. But when you have people still going around saying, my truth is this and my truth is that and they're not feeling the consequence right. of reality because we still live in this you know prosperous tyranny whatever you know everybody's still comfortable right. and fat and well fed yeah. but you know it's like a psychological trial for at least those of us who are still sane but yeah it's gonna have to be so bad that those people go wow my truth was really wrong because i'm not gonna eat today unless i go you know, kill a squirrel I, or something or whatever it is. Yeah, it's definitely, it's going to, I think you got at it. It's going to require people to be uncomfortable and experience very severe hardship. As long as people are comfortable, yeah. they're not going to change. And so that's, that's why as bad as it sounds, a, some sort of economic collapse would at least be some, would allow for those discussions to happen. I'm not saying I'm advocating for that, but it's, we're it's twenty eight trillion dollars in debt. What do we? We're we're we're. we're it's going to happen at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. The question is, are it, then people can't ignore what's right in front yeah. of them. So. Yeah, and that's what I despair. I don't want to live through that. 
but I kind of do too, because it needs to happen. <laughs> and, and how long is it going to take the Phoenix to rise from the ashes, so to speak, you know, that could take, you know, decades, you know, maybe hundreds of years, who knows, but you know, but we keep on keeping on and we pray and we love on each other. And that's, that's all we can do. And, um, you know, try to, you know, I, I get stuck sometimes, you know, because, you know, doing my dissident mama thing and, you know, you just get burned out on people. You're just like, how can people not see what's right in front of their face? But, you know, you, you can't shake the entire globe and change people's mind. You can just deal with your own thing. So really that's the best way to go about it. And it sounds like you're doing that out, um, in the the northwest and i thank you so much for coming on uh tj plug all your stuff uh before we go and tell us anything you want to add that i didn't touch on um yeah i'll just keep it simple you can go to tjmartnell.com that's gonna have links to my podcast all my social media as well as my my various books and then you can find them on amazon so i also have a newsletter i don't send stuff out very regularly you know, i'm spamming people's email boxes trying to sell them something but i just wanted there, but there's an announcement or something like that um, and then, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Well, my show notes will be filled with all of those nuggets and thank you, TJ. God bless you. Stay, stay safe out there. Stay healthy. Keep jumping in those creeks and, uh, have a good one. All right. Thanks for having me on. All right. Bye-bye.